Now you've heard your grandmother talk to you about this for days. Right. What was, what do you remember as your impression as you're walking in there? What, what were you, were you sensing anything or were you just, were you just watching the meeting? You, you hit it, you hit, you hit an atmosphere. It's, and it startled me. It's like getting on a plane in Alaska and landing in Florida. So you actually felt something oh, when you walked immediately, in? Oh, immediately, immediately. Immediately, there, there, was, there was an atmosphere. There was something you walk into, it's like, wow, what's, what's this? I mean, every place has atmosphere. If you go to a rodeo, there's right. atmosphere. If you go to a football game, there's atmosphere. You, you, you know that atmosphere of a football game. So what, what did you think? I, you... I just had never felt that. Right. This was like foreign to me, like, what is this? You know, because I'd never felt that in my church. Mm. So then I thought, this is supposed to be church, what's this? But it was clearly a different climate. You know, because climate creates culture. And so I didn't know about climate and culture, but climate creates culture. And I explain, didn't... Explain more on that. Climate creates culture, what do you mean? Well, if you look around the world, at the right. climates of Brazil and Argentina or England or anything, you know, their, their climate is what creates who they are, the texture of their skin, their hair, their fiber, their diet, right. Right. all of their, their language. So climate creates all of that. I'm so excited today to have with me Pastor Billy Burke. Pastor Burke, thank you for joining with oh, me today. It's and all, to be here. Everybody on the Revival Radio TV team, and we're excited. Mm. Now, those of you who don't know uh, about Pastor Billy Burke, we're going to kind of delve a little bit into his history, and I think you're going to really enjoy hearing his story and maybe some things that you haven't heard before. First off, Pastor Billy, you've mm. got a ministry all over the world. You travel all over the world. Mm doing what you do with miracles and healings mm. and seeing people. And really you're, what we talk about here with Revival is what you do so much of and you talk about, recently you were here at Eagle Mountain Church and we, right. we talked about Revival and you even talked about Revival in your, in your own messages and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But before we get into that, and I got some questions about that, I got yeah, so yeah, much yeah. stuff I want to <laughs> ask. <laughs> Uh, I want to hear from you because so many people don't know your story, mm. and it goes back a few years to when you're age nine. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened. 1962. There's my age. Uh, diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, metastasized. Uh, I was in the hospital in Pittsburgh, in Oakland, and uh, imagine the technology in 1962. Right. Imagine the instruments. Imagine the way they did everything compared to today. So it was uh, archaic in nature. Um, so the, the, the tumor was diagnosed in my head. My eyes had crossed into my head completely. So my vision was either blind or double. My motor skills were gone and paralyzed on one side. Uh, the cancer was spreading into my lungs. My back had lumps all over it. And uh, I, you know, I was, I was raised in an evangelical church, but my grandmother was an avid listener to Catherine Kuhlman on the, just the radio broadcast. Mm. I didn't know Catherine, right. my, my grandmother didn't know Catherine, but she was an avid listener to that radio broadcast. And so when the doctors reached the verdict that uh, I had just had days to live, and that if they did cobalt radiation back then was the big breakthrough thing, and uh, they said if we go into cobalt radiation, we may be able to spare his life for a few months. When my, my grandmother spoke up and said, no, we're having him discharged. And they said, you know, you're crazy. Well, they said, no, I'm taking him to a service a few blocks from here. That's when she was holding meetings at First Presby on 6th Avenue in Pittsburgh Right. every other Friday morning. And so long story short, I mean, that's, I was discharged, had to sign all kind of legal papers to be discharged. Now, let me, before you get into the rest of the story, let's go back to your nine years old. I mean, you're old enough to remember oh, at nine. You remember what was going on. Vividly. Were you scared? Were you frightened as a 
Nine-year-old boy? I was, I was, anybody's afraid whenever your vision goes, you know, and, and the pain was so bad. I mean, there was no, there was no medication that I could take that would help the pain. So we, were you like, were you, you said your vision went, were you blurry or you just, you couldn't double. see? Everything was double. Double vision. Everything was, everything was double. So I, they had to put a patch over my eye to see rather than one eye because everything was double. The tumor had so compressed the brain, the brain stem, the bottom of the brain that, uh, you know, I mean, it was just bad. So the tumor was back in the back of your... Front and back. Back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so uh, when I was discharged, that's when the, the ordeal began at home. The meeting was on Friday with Catherine. I was discharged on a Monday. So for four days, my grandmother was just around the clock. Every time she got a chance. I mean, I had to drink through a straw. I, I couldn't see much. We had buckets of ice water by the sofa, mm. soaking tiles, just right. to try and keep the pain. But my grandmother would say, when she touches you, when she touches you. I say, when who touches me? When Ms. Catherine Coleman's going, she's going to touch you, and you're going to be healed. And, you know, I didn't know it at that time, Jean, but she was preparing me for a miracle. And as I say today, either in church, revival, most people right. don't know how to prepare for that. We but she was actually speaking words of faith to you. Well, that's a way of saying it, but I look at it as she was preparing me for someone who couldn't prepare themselves. Hmm. We prepare to go to church. We don't prepare for revival. We prepare right. for Thanksgiving and Christmas and funerals and celebrations and picnics and vacation. Oh, but right. we don't know how, how do, most people, they don't wake up on Sunday morning and think, I'm going to get healed today. I'm going to have a deliverance today. They prepare for a service, for a sermon. They prepare to go home. They prepare to go to lunch after church, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. But preparing for a miracle is a whole different set of you know, some things take more preparation. Jesus had to lay back four days before he raised his dead cousin. Why? Because he hadn't raised anybody yet. So it took a different right. kind of preparation. So different things take different preparations. And I didn't know how to prepare myself. I was dying. I couldn't stop myself. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know Catherine. I didn't listen to the radio broadcast. I was dependent upon somebody carrying me. And so she prepared me for four days. I got sick of hearing her. <laughs> no, I mean, because yeah. it, was, it was against my flow. Right. I wasn't used to someone was coming into my space saying something. Here I am dying. She's trying to help me, and I'm resisting because I didn't know. I didn't know. Most of us don't know what's on the other side of preparation. If we did, we'd prepare ourselves right. more diligently. So Friday came, Friday morning. We're driving to Pittsburgh. My mother and my dad, my grandmother, we're driving into the Pittsburgh, into the meeting, and... We were 45 minutes away, and my grandmother's saying, oh, when, you know, she's going to call you out, and I'm thinking, I've never seen, I've been in that kind of a meeting. How many people were there at the meeting? Uh, close to 2,000. So it was a big meeting. It was a big meeting. And where were you at? I was in the balcony. When we got there, we couldn't get in. Uh -huh. The people, there was had to be 1,000 people on the outside and 2,000 wow. on the inside, and, and we were ready to turn around and go, and one of the ushers on the side door saw how bad I was. Now, could you walk at this time, or were they with carrying help. you? Only with, with help. help. Right. With help. With human crutches, I could walk. And uh, he saw us from the side door and said, come on, like this. So he snuck us in the side door of that church and up the stairway to the balcony. And she, so he goes over to the front row in the balcony. And I, I put my chin on the railing. And, uh, and, of course, then began this meeting that I had never seen <laughs> anything like that. I mean, uh, she came out and was... You know, she was Catherine Coleman. And I'd just never been in a meeting like that. I just got caught up immediately in what she was doing. You know, just moving in the gifts, the worship. But there was an atmosphere. There was something I was in that I'd never been in before. Let me ask you about that. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you're there in the meeting, mm -hmm. and you get called in mm -hmm. uh, as a nine-year-old. Now, you've heard your grandmother talk to you about this for days. Right. What was? What do you remember as your impression as you're walking in there? What What were you? Were you sensing anything, or were you just, were you just watching the meeting? You, you hit it. You hit. You hit an atmosphere. It's, and it startled me. It's like getting on a plane in Alaska and landing in Florida. So you actually felt something oh, when you walked immediately, in. Immediately. Immediately. There, there was there was an atmosphere. There was something you walk into. It was like wow. What's What's this? I mean, every place has atmosphere. If you go to a rodeo, there's right. atmosphere. If you go to a football game, there's atmosphere. You, you, you know that atmosphere of a football game. So what, what did you think? I, you... I just didn't, I had never felt that. Right. This was like foreign to me, like, what is this? You know, because I'd never felt that in 
my church. Hmm. So then I thought, this is supposed to be church. What's this? But it was clearly a different climate. You know, because climate creates culture. And so I didn't know about climate and culture, but climate creates culture. And I explain, didn't know. Explain more on that. Climate creates culture. What do you mean? Well, if you look around the world at the right. climates of Brazil and Argentina or England or anything, you know, their, their climate is what creates who they are, the texture of their skin, their hair, their fiber, their diet. Right. right. All of their, their language. So climate creates all of that. In the pigmentation of skin. Mm. So, who we are today, how big you know, body parts are, how big, you know, um, from our ears to our nose to our eyes, to our lips, um, to our diet, all of those things. Uh, and that's why we that travel through different cultures enjoy eating different ethnic foods. Right. Because that, we didn't grow up with that, so it's a different taste. And that taste came from their culture. And in the spirit, I mean, there's, a, there's cultures that um, I'm understanding it more today. I mean, I didn't know anything then. All I knew then is I walked into something that was just like, what's this? But it didn't take me long to figure it out. I mean, I was like, wow. And I saw her move and in the power and people getting slain and touched and healed. And I was very much enjoying that. It was like an entertainment. And then she turned around and pointed to me. And she said, you, she said, you get down here. You're being healed of cancer. And I screamed real loud, no. Really? <laughs> oh, I did. And then she said, no. I said, young man, you get down here. And the second time I said, no. And why did you say no? Probably because I was afraid. Just scared yeah. of what was happening. And the third time she said, ushers, get him down here. So uh, Norm, I now know Norm very well. Norm and Donnie, who's not with us now, but she sent Norm and Donnie into the balcony. Uh, and they came over and they said to my grandmother, Miss Coleman wants them. We're here to take him down. And there was no questioning her in those meetings, the way she ran her meetings. It was very strict. Right. And uh, my grandma says, take him. So they picked me up, and my family followed, and walked down the aisle way to meet Miss Coleman. There she's standing waiting, and uh, got down to meet her. And she says, well, there you are. You wouldn't come out of that balcony. She says, what's your name, young boy? What's your name? I said, Billy. And she, I, I said it with, with what language I could. And, and she said, I just want to know one thing from you. That's all I want from you is one thing. And she stuck that right in my face. She said, do you believe? That's all I want to know. And I said, yeah. Well, she turned around to walk away. And I, I remember I took a big sigh of relief thinking, boy, that was easy. And then she suddenly spun. I said, do you believe? Mm. And why just was like, I tried to say yes and no at the same time. <laughs> I was trying yeah. to go, well, because like, I knew she caught me. Right. I knew she sensed that. And before I could even answer her, her hand was coming towards me. As her hand was coming towards me, I could hear my grandmother's voice. When she touches you. When she touches you. See, I could hear her voice, but Catherine's hand. And that's why I know about being prepared. The seed that prepared me for the hand that was about to touch me. You know, that's, I was prepared. Didn't know it. Didn't know. So had I just had a hand come into me, I don't know what would have happened. But I had a hand and a voice. And when that hand hit me, I went and four rows went with me. Four rows in a big church. Hmm. People laying on top of people. And um, Now when you went down, mm -hmm. were you out? Do you have any I consciousness? Couldn't I couldn't move. I was so you, conscious, but I couldn't move. No, sure. I could not move. It was, that was frightening. Because I was just, there was just no movement, just nothing. My whole body was just like froze on the floor. But I could feel this wonderful radiation through me, just up and down, just radiating. Maybe 30, 45 seconds she let it happen, maybe a minute, I don't know. It just seemed like it forever, but she said, bring him up. And she said, oh my, oh my. And I said, uh, oh, well, I didn't realize it, but my paralysis was, my paralysis was gone. There was no pain, I just, but I didn't realize it. I was, I was, I said, what's, what's, what is this? I was able to talk. She said, you need one more. You need one more. And she touched me. Of course, I went down. This time, she said, uh, I remember laying there. And I could hear everything. I could see everything, but I couldn't move again. And she said, if there's anybody in this auditorium with blood cancer, leukemia, uh, she went on, 
she said, you must come now and stand around the, the boy, stand around this boy. I said, He's, there's a radiating faith. And, uh, and then she said a few other things. And, um, and I remember people standing on pews and looking at me and kids looking at me. And, and I was helpless. I just couldn't move. Maybe if she left me there maybe five minutes. Mm. So when I got up after that, she said, uh, well, look at you. I said, I said, this is pretty amazing. I said, I don't have any pain on my leg. She said, take the patch off your eye. I said, no, I don't want to do that. I said, because I have double vision. She said, no, you had double vision. She said, everything else is working. Take the patch off. I said, I'd rather not. She said, either you take the patch off or I'm going to take the patch off. You know? I thought, Where's your grandmother during this time? Right there crying. Okay. And all that. They're all there. Yeah. They're helpless. They're not even really helping me. Yeah. And I thought, who is this lady? <laughs> this, what, what, kind, what church does she belong to? That right. They don't do this at church. Yeah. So I, instead of taking the patch off, I flipped up the patch like that. And to my amazement, my eyes had straightened out. You know, I, mm. was, I was seeing normal. And I just, I lost it. I wow. just thought, wow, what's this? You know, and, uh, and she went on, Holy Spirit. And, you know, did a little bit of prophesying, stuff like that, and I just went, I was amazed. I just was so spellbound. And of course, I walked out of the church. I was carried in, practically, and walked out. Went, came in one way and walked out another way. And uh, the very surgeon, the very surgeon who sentenced me to death, I must have been about two weeks later, he had heard about what had happened, and he didn't believe it. So he came, he drove all the way to my home, knocked on our front door wow. and said, uh, I, I need to see Billy, expecting me to be in bad shape. And so my grandmother took him through the house and she said, see the kid in the red hat playing ball over there? That's him. And he said, it's amazing. He said, there's no way. He said, I don't know what happened. He said, I don't understand how this all happened. He said, I guess miracles do happen. But he said, that's, you have one very lucky, is what he said, very lucky mm -hmm. boy. She said, no, this isn't luck. She said, this, you know, she, went to, she began talking about Holy Spirit and Jesus and all that, right. you know. But that was, my, that was my experience to the healing Jesus. That was my experience. So when you got home that night, mm -hmm. now here's, you're, you're nine years old mm -hmm. and you're, you're, your grandmother's told you that, and you're, I can just imagine you're, you're going home with a realization, one, grandma was right. Right. And well, this, this really happened. This really oh, yeah, the, the experience, the experience never goes away of something like that. Right. It's with you. It's like an eternal tattoo. It's just with you forever, and you relive it and relive it and relive it. And um, but I mean, what you realize, you don't realize the scope of it, or the ripple effect of it, or the purpose of it. Purpose never something that's always in our mind at the moment. Why I was spared? Why my brother was killed by a drunk driver at 16? Why him and not me? He was a better boy. Well, let's, let's pick up with that. Okay, mm -hmm. so so you, you're you're a healed nine year old boy. I assume at that point life just went on as normal. Never normal. Never normal because you know my friends all thought something was strange about me. They ah. thought, uh, you know, we got to be careful around you. You might die. You might. Oh, okay. You know, it was that kind of a thing. So that that age was very hard for me. Ten, eleven, twelve uh, was very hard. Um, but you know, but I did. You know, I did ascertain normalcy in the sense I did go to school, but it was difficult right. to be. I, I continued to be involved in everything. I was, you know, sports, and right. but there was always that stigma that would circulate through the grapevine. Yeah. You know, he had uh, something wrong with his head. You know, he, yeah. all that. So you had to kind of live that through that. My parents divorced when I was 13, hmm. so my mother and my brother and myself, my younger brother David, we moved in with my grandparents. And that's where we lived. And uh, at that stage is whenever I backslid, you know, I was, at that time, I was still going, doing, sharing my testimony from 9 to 13. i go to church camps, churches, vacation Bible school, anywhere I could share my testimony. But none of the churches ever wanted me to mention her name. Really? Mm -hmm. Did they say why? Just don't say her? Well, they didn't like her. Hmm. No, the people around the surrounding areas were not, as history tells us, that so many revivals started, were started by paraministries, not the church itself. Mm. So God had to light a fire somewhere else. Right. And so often they, they, they fight each other, which is sad, but that's just the way it is. It is. And uh, so at 13, uh, that's when I began to just, you know, uh, 
Catherine reached out to me at 13. I didn't want nothing to do. I said, no, I'm fine now. So you said she reached out. So she wrote you a letter? Is that what she did? Or called She called. You? She called. called. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, that's interesting. So this is several years later, she calls to see how you're 13. doing? Well, yeah, just to see how I'm doing because I, she heard, you know, that we live in a small town, 45 minutes from Pittsburgh, but I mean, right. you know, we are, one of our family members, my grandmother was very close to one of her main uh, bus captains at that time. So looking back at it, I don't know how all that news got back to her. I don't mm, know. I don't know. I honestly don't know. But she had an interest, you know. And uh, so what happened was, is with that divorce, I just went 13, 14, 15, 16, all those years, 17, 18. I was 19, uh, and I was planning on going into another business. You know, my I had people step up were offering to pay college for me to go to ORU. Right. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to go into the ministry. I didn't want to preach. I was just really against it. And I, well, well, why? Let me ask you that if, it, if it's okay without well, risking sure. being too personal. But no. you had such a huge miracle. I in know. Your life. I Obviously. Know. Uh, and I, I want everyone to understand mm -hmm. that, you know, all of this, there, there's a there's an ebb and flow that we've talked about mm -hmm. before. But mm -hmm. so here you, you're, you're nine years old. You have this huge miracle. You're speaking mm -hmm. in church mm -hmm. camps and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yet you didn't want anything to do with it at this point. Well, because it was an oddity at the time. So at, that like, at that time, I, I was more interested in fitting in. Right, than, than standing out. Than standing out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, pre the pressure of, of being alone, um, right. with, especially with that kind of a story, made me alone even among my peers. Right. So if I'm in church, I'm still alone. You know, because the church, even the church kids thought, oh, you think you're better than us now. Oh, okay. See, so everywhere that I went, I had nowhere to be. There was nowhere, there was no landing spot. So I found a greater social acceptance with friends outside the church who didn't know anything about it. Mm. So, you know, now as, as, I grew, as I grew older, see, they, the more and less, and I never talked about it. Right. I knew. My grandmother knew. My mother knew. But I, I never took that to high school. I never took that to in my backslidden life, although the Holy Spirit never left me. That's the amazing thing, never yes. left me. Uh, I still can't figure that out other than, like Brother Kenneth said the other night, last night, G-R-A-C-E, grace. Right. But I mean, that was a, so there were periods of there where you, you feel like you're living a secret life. Mm. And uh, I would rarely go to church, rarely, maybe Christmas, New Year's. Um, so I didn't hear from Catherine for all those years uh, until I hit, uh, like I said, 18, 18, 19, uh, after my brother was killed. He was hit by a drunk driver. Um, and uh, So where were you at the time when you learned that your brother was killed? I was on my, I was home alone. Everybody, my grandma, grandparents, everybody was away from home and uh, the state police called and said, you know, we, we just, you know, the home of David Burke, you know, we need to come identify the body, all that. And, um, I, you know, I just fell apart because mm -hmm. I just, we were very close, close family. And right. so no one in the family knew but me. They were all away. So when they came home, I had to tell them. And uh, that began a, uh, as, as many watching this, show of yours knows when cancer or death or anything serious hits a family, it affects the whole family. Right. And uh, so I went to a couple of different pastors. I was really seeking answers, you know, about eternity and about, you know, heaven, hell, all that stuff, sovereign election. I went to about three pastors and none of them really was able to help me. You know, and I was felt very, and, and maybe they did, maybe I wasn't open to help looking back at it. So I don't want to say anything like that, but I didn't get any peace with anything that they said. And uh, I knew I had to come to terms with, you know, wow, why was he taking me left? I had cancer all through me. He was healthy. Mm -hmm. I get healed. He gets hit by a drunk driver. You know, totally the driver's fault, you know. And uh, why does he die younger than me when I was right there with, you know, months to go? And that whole thing really bothered me. Right. And uh, and that's when Maggie Hartner, who was Catherine's main lady, called, and she said, Catherine said she wants to meet you. 
You know, she said, now, you know, this is your time. So, so you went and saw her. Now, let me take a pause right here. Those of you that were, that maybe you're old enough, you could have seen Catherine Kuhlman, um, or maybe you're young enough, you, you missed her. You can still, when you go to, you can go to YouTube and you can watch mm -hmm. videos and you can still see, I remember as a boy, mm -hmm. Watch. I was never in a Catherine Kuhlman meeting, but I mm -hmm. remember playing and wa running through the house and stopping mm -hmm. <laughs> because my parents had the TV on in the middle of the day, which mm -hmm. was unheard of. Mm -hmm. And it was Catherine Kuhlman, and I just was almost mm -hmm. locked in, like, "What is going yeah, on? Who is this? Right. What is she doing?" Right. And and to this day, mm -hmm. if I see something, it'll. I mean, I just will be locked in and focused because mm -hmm. I'm like. There was such a, a power, and it's that apprehension. What is going to happen next? Right, right. It's like always, like right. What is she going to do? What mm -hmm. is she going? To, here it is, all these years later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what is she going to do? Yeah, so she's she, unique. Unique. I mean, we're all. Everybody's unique in their right. way, right? You know, you learn that too later. But f being a young young person and never seeing anything like that. I mean, today you have so many different personalities, right? right? So she would blend in more today, I think. I really do. But then, in a small town outside of Pittsburgh, you know, a blue-collar town, mm -hmm. where everything was, you know, hard-working, labor, steel mill, plain vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, here comes this lady in a white gown. Have you been waiting? I've been waiting for you. Have you been waiting for me? I forget what all. And it was just yeah. like, wow. It was just so way over the top for me. Yeah. So I began to take my friends down to meet her. I would take you know, my friends down to, because they couldn't believe it. Understanding revivals is a big task. And it's one when I started diving into learning more, one thing led to the next and led to the next. And it's almost a daunting task to be able to understand all about what happened in our history when it comes to what God did throughout history with the revivals. Well, what have we done? We've taken our time and we've developed a website right here behind me, RevivalRadioTV.com. Now this is, of course, this is on a big monitor, so you can use it on your computer, it'll work on your phone and your iPad or whatever tablet you've got. You can go to it on any of this, and all the one I'm talking about will work on any of it. But let me show you one feature. Now here is uh, in 1837, uh, talking about the Armenian revival. If I just scroll down here, Look, here's, uh, here we are. Here's uh, William Seymour, Azusa Street, 1870. So when you see this, you say, well, I want to know more about William Seymour. Well, I'll click on more. Now, look at this. I have, I have a history of him. There's 138 stories right here that I can click on and learn more about William Seymour and the revival. Now, there's another way to do this. Let's go back here. Let's say you don't like the way this, look, I can click here and I can go to a 3D version. <clears throat> and on this version, I can go through time like this. So you see, I can go through all of it. There's Varanayev talking about history, Vasily in Russia. You can just go through history and understand what happens with the revivals. Go ahead to the website, sign up, and join us.